All right, so now we're going to start talking about sort of the ideological apparatus and ideological capture. Uh, the progressive humanitarian narrative in academia, the, midi the media and in politics about immigration, I think, uh, constitutes a kind of ideological apparatus for the justification and acceleration of open borders. It's another essential element in this process of open borders in which migration gets framed as uh, not as an economic strategy for the corporate world, which is what it is, uh, or even for the country, but instead as a moral imperative and as a humanitarian issue. And this framing shields the entire process from criticism. So we'll tie it in first with talking about sort of the financial structure uh, with the media, right? Um, so it's paid for by the rich, <laughs> right? Uh, this ideological apparatus is paid for by the rich, of course. Uh, the first, the best way of understanding the media's ideological capture, I think, is in what Noam Chomsky calls the propaganda filter. If you're not familiar with it, I suggest you read something like Manufacturing Consent. It's worth checking out. And basically, there are five components uh, or five mechanisms by which the ideology becomes uh, hegemonic in the media. Uh, one, the media are owned by major corporate conglomerates. And so the corporate profit motive is what guides uh, media content. Two, profits don't come from people buying the newspaper or watching the news show or whatever. They come from advertisers. The media sell the audience as a product to advertisers, and they're doing that. They're selling your eyeballs, your attention, in order for the advertisers to be able to influence you. Three, in the way that uh, experts are selected on various subject areas, right? That uh, enforces a kind of ideological pressure. We'll talk about that in a second, um, or I guess to preview it. <laughs> so for example, somebody from Catholic Charities is going to be an expert on immigration and how they acclimate to the United States or something like that, because they're the people that do it, right? They're the people that have hands-on experience that are on the ground, but their financial incentive is to promote it, right? So they get selected as an expert to give testimony about this issue in the media, but they already have a perspective, right? And it's the open borders perspective. Additionally, if people sort of step out of line, they're threatened, they, you know, they're pressured to legal threats, PR backlash, et cetera, and so they self-censor. And the fifth mechanism is that only people who share the dominant ideology get hired in the first place, get promoted, avoid being fired. Um, today we might say avoid getting canceled, et cetera. And so this is basically a model for understanding the capture of media by corporate interests. Um, the media is obviously one of the fundamental channels through which public opinion is manufactured. Um, and so the dominant ideology uh, in culture is captured. Not only that, but what gets considered high status perspective versus low status perspective, things like that. These are all media effects in part. And so the corporate interest is in open borders. So that's going to be the lens through which the media tends to view immigration issues. And you see this in public interest stories about immigrants, how hard it is crossing the border. They get painted as sympathetic, hardworking, like family-oriented people or whatever. You'll hear about how good it is for the economy in the media. You'll get lots of reinforcement for the belief that people who oppose it are xenophobic, racist pigs or whatever. Um, and so, and uh, the people that the experts are are the media are consulting as experts, of course, like I just said, they're the people from the NGOs. Um, so they get, they're like, they're the experts, they're on the ground, we'll invite them to talk, you know. Uh, in the media, you'll see stuff like Trump said, they're sending our rapists, criminals, whatever. Uh, so he's a racist, that's really bad. <laughs> you know, people forget this, but that was the dominant attitude on Fox 2 when he was running. Uh, they've had to capitulate a bit about it. But they don't like his position on immigration, on arbitrage, on globalization. That's the stuff they really hate him for. And so they've capitulated a bit, but they've pushed for concessions. Like, maybe we can get, you know, more visas. Maybe we can get some amnesty. Uh, you know, let's, let's promote immigration. Let's make it easier pathways to being a legal immigrant. And that way we can reduce the number of illegals a little bit, et cetera, et cetera. Right? They push for these kind of concessions. Trump has shaken things up. But outside of the Trump phenomenon, make no mistake, conservative media and conservative politicians are also pro-migration. They're also captured by the corporate interest. Their rhetoric about it tends to be more about the economics and how it's economically advantageous. 
And the left-wing media tends to frame it more in terms of human rights and anti-racism and stuff like that. Um, that's the only difference, really. Reagan and Bush are as bad on these issues as any Dems. Uh, this is a major part of why there has been such a powerful immune response to Trump, why he's so hated. So the government's captured, the media is captured, uh, the left and right wing ecosystems in both of these institutions are equally captured, the international community is captured, uh, international organizations are promoting it, NGOs promote it, the financial world promotes it, uh, open borders that is. And so this that already has a huge effect on public discourse. And we already, in this way, get a kind of covering over of the issue of open borders uh, and, and this discourse with a kind of humanitarian rhetoric. Um, ESG frames the profit motive for open borders as being about diversity and inclusive social governance, right? The UN and the NGOs are part of this whole advocacy and pressure sort of network promoting it. Um, an organization like Amnesty International, for example, they're already framing... Um, restrictive immigration policies as inhumane and open borders as necessary for justice and equality. They're already having this kind of impact on the public discourse. Uh, and again, they're the people that the media are going to treat as experts. Their reports are what people are going to cite in the media, in, uh, in Congress and things like that. Um, additionally, you know, think tanks, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but the situation actually gets much worse. Let's talk about academia next, because it's an important part of this propaganda nexus. And similar to how we discussed the process of immigration, how little people understand it, I think we really need to zoom in on academia and what goes on in academia and explain that to people because no one understands it either. Uh, so once again, these private foundations like the Open Society Foundation, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, they are pouring billions and billions of dollars into academia. They fund research, they fund scholars, they funded the creation of entire academic programs in areas like social justice studies, critical theory, human rights, global peace studies, migration studies. They promote scholarship and intersectionality and post-colonial studies, critical race theory, all of this shit. Open Society Foundation alone has awarded over $18 billion globally since its inception, providing significant grants to institutions like Harvard, Yale, the London School of Economics, supporting scholars and programs who thematically, you guessed it, align with open borders and global governance. How does this process work? So a foundation will establish a grant, a chair, or an endowment tied to a specific area of scholarship or academic position. And these awards, these positions are often very prestigious. They offer greater job security. They attract high level scholars who then exert influence within those departments. To get these positions or grants or whatever, you submit a research proposal, statement of purpose, or some of your research, and this shows your alignment with their stated mission, i.e. open borders, <laughs> uh, let's say. Uh, and then they'll select the guy who has published a lot on the social injustice of border restrictions or how closing the borders is a human, human rights catastrophe or whatever. And so basically they're chosen by a review panel based on ideological conformity. And then they have this prestigious chair in the department, this position, it gives them a lot of power and influence academically. Um, the foundations will also just create entire departments, whole cloth. So, uh, for example, in migration studies, let's say, and it'll be attached to stipulations and expectations about the ideology that's going to be orthodox here. Uh, for example, it was the Ford Foundation in the 70s and 80s that funded the creation of all of these new departments of ethnic studies, post-colonial studies, critical race theory, all over the country. And so you get these new departments, you get these scholars getting these endowments, grants, chairs, they gain credibility and influence, uh, hiring, they're on hiring committees, they're on selection committees for grad students, and these people are the top dogs in the department. And not only that, but when students are looking for advisors, and they're looking for mentors, they often go to these professors. And if you want to climb the ladder in academia, you need to secure these positions, these grants. So guess what? You need to start producing research in these areas. And from this perspective, receiving foundation support is going to enhance the scholar's ability to publish research, to network with other scholars who are also receiving these funds, to gain invitations to speak at conferences and on panels. And so the distribution channel for these ideas is wide open in a way that it isn't necessarily for other scholars. 
And then these academic experts are treated similarly to the experts from the think tanks. They also get brought on the news. Their work is also cited in Congress. They're brought in to testify. Except their relationship to what is ultimately also corporate funding is a little bit more obscure to outsiders, and so they're treated as sort of more legitimate. Uh, I think uh, in many ways. And then on top of that, this is what gets taught to young people all over the country. So by this process, this ideological consensus gets embedded in academia and then filters out into the media and public discourse and influences policy and also really molds the worldview of young people, <laughs> sort of crucial. And so, and so sort of singing in unison, we have the NGOs, the think tanks, the media, the politicians, the international organizations, corporations through their talk about corporate social responsibility and ESG. And so this song exercises a kind of total control over the framing of issues related to immigration in the public discourse. Immigration is talked about as though it's a humanitarian necessity, that closing the border would be a moral crime. It's turning away suffering women and children. Restrictionism is racist, xenophobic, uh, part of the colonial legacy of the oppression of marginalized peoples. Uh, that opening the border and accepting migrants is all about social justice. It's about human rights. It's about equality. It's inherently just. And so critique of it then uh, can't really gain any traction in public discourse. At every, let's say, like node in the communications matrix, we have total corporate capture. And the real motive in this issue is corporate profits. Um, it's, you know, let's get rich off of arbitrage. But nowhere is it framed that way, and criticism of it is seen as fundamentally just about racism. The only reason you could possibly support limiting immigration is because you're racist. If you're on the left, this is like moral absolute. It's about human rights. It's about goodness. This is everything good and pure and beautiful in the world. If you're a conservative, like you should at least be pro-business, and uh, immigration's great for business. So if, if it's great for business and you're a conservative and you still don't like it, why don't you like it? You must be a racist. <laughs>